My sermon passage is Romans chapter 7, verses 15 to 25a, page 982 in the Pew Bible. <clears throat> Paul is writing, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. So then it is no longer I that do it, but sin which dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do not what now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin which dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin, which dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The word of the Lord. Be to God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. So was Paul mixed up, confused, or what? It's even hard to read. Well, maybe he was, but maybe not. Hear this, which I saw on Facebook. The other day, I was hanging out with a friend. This friend is a Christian, but she doesn't always act, speak, or think like one. Some days, she is completely in line with God's word, and some days her life is a struggle that gets the best of her. As our eyes met, I really wanted to say something about it, but I decided to let the Lord speak to her heart, knowing nothing that I say will have the same impact as the Father's words. So I prayed with her, and after some time had passed, I winked at her and walked away from the mirror. I try every day, and I fail every day, it goes on. I am so not perfect. I am a work in progress, and I'm thankful for God's grace and his promises to his believers. That was on a post on Facebook on a page called Happy to be a Presbyterian. <laughs> Check it out if you haven't. And it's PCUSA, <laughs> Presbyterians too. Now, I don't know if the person who posted it was working on a sermon, and there's lots of preachers on that page, as you might imagine. Uh, but it sure seems to fit the Apostle Paul's apparent anguish as he expresses it in this letter to the Roman Christians. Some days she is completely in line with God's words, God's word, and some days her life is a struggle that gets the best of her, the Facebook person wrote. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do, Paul wrote. Well, if Paul was mixed up, if he was confused, haven't we all been? Yes. yes. Haven't we all found ourselves torn, caught in the internal tug of war between right and wrong, good and bad, sinner and saint, me or you, I or thou? The eternal internal question. Dallas Holm put it to music years ago in a song that I've carried with me since I heard it in 1981. It's a pop contemporary Christian song. It's a simple song, but a deep emotion and a deep thought and a profound reality. He goes, how can I be so wrong when I'm trying to be so right? Why is it taking so long to win this fight? The struggle goes on each day, fighting inside my mind. Victory sometimes seems hard to find. Oh, wretched man am I. Who can save me from this subtle death? Thank you, Lord. You have heard my prayer. And I'll praise you now until my final breath. 
Have you ever prayed that? Have you ever prayed anything like that? I know, I suspect you have. He goes on. Do you mind if I do? Please give me strength today to help me stand on my feet. I'm tired of falling down in defeat. Help me be more like you. You are my closest friend. Stay with me all the time till the end. Oh, wretched man am I. Who can save me from this subtle death? Thank you, Lord. You have heard my prayer. And I'll praise you now until my final death. Final breath. Death, breath. You know, I was close to both Friday. And I'll talk about it after the service. It was a, it was a, it was a wonderful time. The tug of war runs deep in the tradition of our faith. Like so much else, we in the West have over-personalized this, I think, too much. For the ancient Israelites, like the earliest Christians, the community was the thing more than the individual. Both were the thing, but the community was the bigger thing. Listen to Moses from Deuteronomy 29 and verse uh, and 30. Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, See, I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you are entering to take possession of. But if your heart turns away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you this day that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land which you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and cleaving to him. For that means life to you and length of days. Choose ye this day who ye will serve indeed, y'all. It's another y'all. So if it's about the beloved community, not necessarily the beloved individual, what was the Apostle Paul getting on about? Dallas Home, I think, in his song, was wrestling with the kind of internal personal guilt that so many Christians can't get, let go of that it seems to define and drive certain branches and whole denominations of the church. It drives them. It drives guilt-laden individuals to judge other individuals based on their own guilty feelings. It's like, oh, if I feel this guilty when I'm so churchy, then you must really be guilty of something serious, you sinner. <laughs> I think that goes on in the way the church thinks of itself sometimes. But what about Paul? If anyone's conversion took, wasn't it Saul? the fire-breathing anti-Christian crusader who saw the risen Lord who personally called him to repentance. Saul wasn't just born from above. He got a new name, Paul. So what was Paul carrying on about? Well, first, he may not have been talking about himself. He may have been speaking for humanity as a whole, or more likely the first human, Adam. The imagined cry of Adam before Adam experienced God's grace. In any case, whether he is speaking to his own personal experience with sin or of Adam's and therefore all of humanity's, Paul nails it. We can't help ourselves. There is none righteous. No, not one. But I think we probably read this passage or hear it and imagine that it's all Paul. Paul's internal struggle between flesh and spirit. And I wonder whether any of us really feel sorry for him or do we feel solidarity with him? <laughs> As someone has observed, we are shocked and relieved by this risky bit of self-disclosure by Paul. Paul can seem so perfect, so demanding, so holier than thou. 
My wife said, literally. <laughs> but finally, Paul has put all his cards on the table. He is a flawed and failed person, just like the rest of us. Paul, a flawed and failed person, just like the rest of us. But maybe not. I mean, yes, of course, Paul was human, faithful, but faulty, faulty, but faithful. But his own psychological experience is probably not what he was trying to get across in this, what looks like a lament. It is a lament, ending with this rhetorical flourish. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And it is rhetoric. That doesn't mean it's not also personal. And maybe that's the strength of it. Paul is putting words to his own experience as well as that of others. Maybe all of humanity. Maybe Jewish converts to Christ when they were pre-converts. Then as Paul saw it, they were still contending with the law of Moses, right? Rather than living in God's grace and in the freedom of Christ. Anybody can hear themselves in that, in that struggle. Any community, any individual. And technically, I got to get technical sometimes. Technically, the Greek rhetorical device he's using is prosopopoeia. Prosopopoeia. It means speech in character. That's letting an imaginary person or thing speak in the first person to make a good and effective argument. Here are two other examples from Scripture. <clears throat> Wisdom personified is allowed to speak to the people and to the reader and to the hearer of the book of Syrac, also called Ecclesiasticus, chapter 24. It says, Wisdom will praise herself and will glory in the midst of her people. In the assembly of the Most High, she will open her mouth, and in the presence of his host, she will glory. Quote, I came forth from the mouth of the Most High and covered the earth like a mist. That's wisdom speaking. Another example is in Jeremiah chapter 47, where there's a little snippet of a conversation between the sword of the Lord and the prophet Jeremiah. Oh, sword of the Lord, how long till you're quiet? Put yourself in your scabbard. Rest. Be still. Well, how can it be quiet when the Lord has given it a charge? He has appointed it. I love that. Jeremiah's arguing with the sword. And so it's a personification given voice. A modern example for music, although I guess it is 55 years old, <laughs> from the Beatles. I look at you all. See the love there that's sleeping? While my guitar gently weeps, hear the voice. And here's one more, and it's not quite as old, although I am real behind on what's popular. <laughs> this is from Dwight Yoakam 30 years ago, and it's subtle. It's about as subtle, it's about as subtle, I think, as the Apostle Paul. And it's a great, bad country song, not a hit. Wasn't even a single, but I love it because it's really so real, so country real. <laughs> and I can't believe I'm singing Dwight Yoakam, but I'm going He's in an old flea bit, bar, uh, flea bit hotel, and he's drowning his sorrows, right, over a lost love. And one of the verses says, Two doors down, there's a bar stool that knows me by name. And we sit there together and wait for you. <laughs> it's awful. See, it's an example of prosopopoeia. That thing has a voice in this emotional message that he's trying to get across. The voice of the barstool is implied. It knows me by name, so it must have called out his name. Just as subtle as Paul quoting an imaginary rhetorical person, quoting, before there were such things as punctuation in the Bible. That didn't happen until the 1500s. So, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Who's speaking? It took Bible, callers, Bible scholars quite a while to detect that this was rhetoric and to hear that Paul was kind of being a ventriloquist for this imaginary person in his story, in his argument, to make a point about not just himself, but about others. And one of the big clues is that Paul is usually concerned with community. 
not just individuals. And Paul is usually concerned with cosmology, that it means the life, the universe, and everything, right? Not just the neighborhoods where he walked and taught and prought or preached. And the groaning of creation itself, yearning for salvation and healing, as he put it in another place, and well, us, me, you, y'all, and us, Jesus' yoke may be easy, his burden light. But friends, it's still a yoke, and it's still something that we carry with us, the burden. And he and they and we, as human beings, fail to resist temptation and the power of sin. We fail, we confess. All through that anguish. But we can't miss the last two verses in Paul's bigger point, which he makes. For all the rhetorical flourishes, he makes this point in three steps with three confessions of his own, his people's own, and our own. I do not understand my own actions. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who? We're trapped. We can't rescue ourselves. So then who? He answers. It turns out that it's not an eternal, internal question after all. It's an internal question with an eternal answer. Who? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.